Welcome to Arlington National Cemetery's Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Centennial Commemoration Lecture Series. My name is Allison Finkelstein, and I serve as Arlington's senior historian. In this episode, our featured expert is Mr. Zach Wilski. Zach Wilski is the senior historian for U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS. He has worked in the USCIS History Office and Library since 2002. His research interests include the history of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the INS, the development of federal immigration and nationality policies, and the uses of INS records for historians and genealogists. He speaks regularly at genealogy and academic conferences, has published articles on researching with INS records, and he has served as the president of the Society for History in the Federal Government. He received history degrees from St. Ambrose University and the University of Maryland. In his episode, titled A Native or an Adopted Son, Immigrant Service Members in World War I, Zach will explore foreign-born soldiers' contributions to America's war effort. He will explain how during the First World War, nearly 18% of American enlisted men were foreign-born. Many of these immigrant service members returned to the U.S. and became naturalized citizens. Others lost their lives in service to their adopted country, and an immigrant, as Zach explains, could have been buried in the tomb. Hello, my name is Zach Wilski, and I'm a historian for the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, or USCIS. Before I start my talk, I'd like to thank the folks from Arlington National Cemetery for inviting me to speak today, and thank all of you for taking the time to listen. Now, for those of you that don't know, USCIS is the federal government agency that administers our lawful immigration system. That means that we do things like process visa applications, oversee refugee and asylum programs, and naturalize new citizens. Though USCIS has only been around for about 20 years, we trace our history back more than a century to federal and immigration and naturalization agencies, such as the Bureaus of Immigration and Naturalization, and later the Immigration and Naturalization Service, or INS. Part of my job is to tell the stories of those agencies and the people who worked there. So for my short talk today, I'm gonna to focus on immigrant members of the armed forces during World War I and talk a little bit about the Bureau of Naturalization's Soldier Naturalization Program which allowed more than 300,000 World War I soldiers and veterans to become U.S. citizens. The title of my talk is A Native or an Adoptive Son. That title comes from President Harding's remarks at the dedication of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which took place more than 100 years ago on November 11, 1921. By mentioning the adopted sons it served, Harding rec was recognizing the thousands of immigrants who gave their lives for their adopted country during the war. In general, Harding's speech emphasized that the soldier buried in the tomb represented all of the diverse Americans that had served and sacrificed during World War I. As Harding put it, he might have come from any of one of a million American homes. At the start of the war, there was a good chance that a soldier's home was an immigrant home. Between 1900 and 1920, nearly 15 million immigrants came to the United States, and immigrants made up nearly 15% of the country's population. Incidentally, that's about the current percentage of immigrants in the United States. It makes sense, then, that as the American military mobilized to enter World War I in 1917, its ranks filled with a diverse cross-section of immigrants from around the world. At the start of the war, many Americans feared that so-called hyphenated Americans would not support the U.S. war effort and would evade military service if they could. And while it must be said that immigrant communities had diverse and often conflicting views of the wars, like other Americans did, overall they supported the effort much like other Americans. Immigrants made up 18% of those who were drafted and accounted for nearly one in five soldiers. If you recall that I said that immigrants made up about 15% of the population, you might even argue that they were overrepresented in military service. Some military units even became known for their many immigrant members. One example was the 77th Infantry Division, which was nicknamed the Melting Pot Division because its membership reflected New York City's diverse immigrant population. The diversity of American forces is perhaps best represented in the iconic Americans All War Bond poster. The poster listed more than a dozen names of soldiers who died for their country and most of the names are decidedly of an immigrant origin, including such names as O'Brien, Turkovich, Kowalski, and Gonzalez. Upon entering the armed forces, many immigrant service members could not speak English well and had not been exposed to American life outside their own communities. In many ways, American military service 
itself helped break down ethnic barriers by placing native-born and immigrant soldiers from diverse places into units alongside each other, allowing each to learn more about the others. To further integrate immigrant soldiers, the War Department offered a variety of English language classes to immigrants in wartime training camps. These classes often included lessons in civics and citizenship to help Americanize the men and prepare them both for the battlefield and for life as engaged American citizens after the war. The Bureau of Naturalization continued these efforts after the war by promoting citizenship education for returning soldiers. In another effort to integrate non-citizen soldiers, Congress passed legislation allowing for the expedited naturalization of foreign board members of the military. These laws both encouraged immigrant enlistment and rewarded those who served. While the laws did not automatically grant citizenship to service members, they did make it very easy for members of the armed forces to become citizens. Under wartime naturalization provisions, service members only needed to, to prove that they were enlisted and get the testimony from two witnesses to naturalize. The law exempted soldiers from having to have resided in the U.S. for at least five years, relieved them from most preliminary paperwork, and eliminated the requirements to speak English or to demonstrate their knowledge of U.S. history and civics. Under the law, immigrant soldiers could become naturalized citizens in as little as a day. Naturalizing as many non-citizen soldiers as possible before they shipped out became a massive effort spearheaded by the Bureau of Naturalization, the federal office then responsible for overseeing naturalization in the courts. At the time, the Bureau employed just 145 examiners and 76 clerks, many of whom were temporary wartime appointments. To carry out the effort, the Bureau found, the Bureau found it necessary to, quote, overnight devise new means and new machinery for performing the mass of work entailed. The new means and machinery including dispatching examiners to military bases to interview soldiers and fill out paperwork on site. The Bureau also enlisted volunteer attorneys and hastily trained servicemen to serve as temporary examiners. Officers often served as witnesses for all of the naturalizing soldiers in their command, sometimes dozens at a time. In short, the Bureau of Naturalization set up citizenship mills on military bases. To swear in dozens of soldiers all at once, the Bureau of Naturalization worked with courts to schedule sessions on-site at military bases. On the bases, judges performed large open-air ceremonies where rolls of soldiers swore the oath of allegiance simultaneously. These large ceremonies, which today, or at least up until a couple years ago, are the version of the naturalization ceremony most of us are familiar with, were a wartime invention designed to naturalize as many soldiers as possible at one time. Under these techniques, from May 9, 1918, when the military naturalization law was passed, until January 11, 1919, more than 160,000 members of the armed forces became naturalized citizens. That's more than 27,000 per month. In all, during the war and in the years immediately following it, more than 300,000 non-citizen service members and veterans became U.S. citizens under special provisions for those who served in the First World War. In a very, really way, oops, in a very real way, then, the war made citizens out of thousands of immigrants. Thirteen immigrants received the Medal of Honor for their actions during World War I. Included among them were soldiers who gained citizenship under expedited processes for servicemen. I have time to highlight just two. First, Marcelina Serna was a Mexican immigrant who was awarded the Medal of Honor for single-handedly capturing 24 German soldiers during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. He became Texas' most decorated World War, I, World War I soldier and became a U.S. citizen in 1925. In 2016, a century after Serna immigrated to the U.S., Congress officially renamed a port of entry on the Mexican border as the Marcelina Serna Port of Entry. I think he serves as an excellent reminder that not all immigrant soldiers came from Europe. On a related note, it is beyond the scope of my talk today, but I think I should also mention here that thousands of American Indians also served in the U.S. Armed Forces during World War I, and many of them gained citizenship through special naturalization laws as well. Second, I'd like to highlight Louis Van Ertzel, who came to the United States from Holland. Working as a merchant marine on his way to the U.S., he heroically saved 27 British sailors whose ship had been sunk by a German U-boat. Upon arrival in the States, he soon declared his intention to become a U.S. citizen and enlisted in the Army. In France, Van Ertzel's heroic actions in scouting the location of enemy defenses on a bridge were believed to have saved thousands of life and earned him the Medal of Honor. In 1919, he became a U.S. citizen just two days before he was discharged from the Army. Upon the U.S. entry into World War II, he enlisted again at the age of 43. He died in 1987 at the age of 93 and is buried here in Arlington Cemetery. Heroics by immigrant soldiers like Serna and Van Ertzel, as well as immigrant communities' support of the war effort, caused many Americans to acknowledge immigrant contributions. Likewise, by serving in the war, or sending their sons to fight and supporting the war effort, many Americans were able to connect to mainstream American life during the war. But it is also important to acknowledge that the war did not erase the unease with immigration that many Americans felt before the war, and that not all immigrants shared equally in the gains the war provided. 
After the war, the nation faced inflation, unemployment, labor unrest, and other problems. Just months before President Harding gave his speech here on November 11th, he signed the Emergency Quota Act of 1921, which created quotas that severely limited the number of immigrants who can enter the United States. That same year, Hidemitsu Toyota, a Japanese immigrant veteran of the war, applied for citizenship based upon his wartime service. His application was ultimately denied because then-current U.S. laws barred the naturalization of Asians. He took his case all the way to the Supreme Court and lost. Toyota did not become a U.S. citizen until 1959, after the law had changed and he was 71 years old. I think that at the time of World War I, the debates about American immigration and the discrimination that many immigrants faced may have inspired some non-citizens to join the military and also to become citizens. They may have wished to show they deserved full membership in the nation and wanted to provide themselves with a, b a better opportunity to shape the nation's future. Many of them achieved those goals. Of course, many other immigrants lost their lives in service of their adopted nation, often before attaining their American citizenship, which is, of course, part of the reason why the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier was dedicated. As President Harding stated, we do not know if a native son or an adopted son is entombed there, but as Harding concluded, that matters little because they glorified the same loyalty and they sacrificed alike. Thanks again for listening, and if you would like to learn more about immigrants in the First World War, please visit the history section of, US, of the USCIS.gov website.